I would like to welcome you to Detroit and introduce uh, Dr. Terry Jackman from Waterdown in Ontario, Dr. Joseph Hewitt from Los Angeles in California, and uh, my name is Mark Hakey, and we're here today to talk a little bit about the current status of CCSVI and multiple sclerosis. And Terry, perhaps you could give us an overview of your um, background and your interest in this area. Sure. Well, first of all, I'm a patient. I was diagnosed with uh, multiple sclerosis almost 26 years ago, and I've just uh, sought treatment um, for a CCSVI, so that's um, an experience that I'm thrilled with, and I'll share a bit more about it. And I'm also a naturopathic doctor, so I have the experience of seeing uh, many, many patients who make the decision to have CCSVI or not. My own experience was wonderful. I went down with some skepticism only because I've been diagnosed for so long and was delighted to find a number of improvements that have really changed the quality of my life. So, uh, nice surprise. Uh, some immediate things that um, uh, you hear frequently, an, an improvement in temperature, an improvement in bladder, um, an improvement in energy, and then certainly my core balance is, is the big win for me there because I feel like I can learn how to walk all over again. So. And you do this for a living. Yes. Which um, is a wonderful thing. My name is Dr. Joseph Hewitt. I'm a physician. I'm an interventional radiologist. One of the founding partners of Synergy Health Concepts and Pacific Interventional in Costa Mesa, California. We practice exclusively in Costa Mesa. We've been treating people with venous abnormalities for a very long time. 15 years. Um, our practice has been established for three years, but we've been treating these venous abnormalities for a very long time. Um, when we became aware of the concept of CCSVI, we f really felt uh, we could lend a great deal of knowledge and experience to the treatment of the problem, and that's really how we got involved. Uh, I'm Mark Hakey, and I'm a physicist uh, at Wayne State University here in Detroit, and also with the MRI Institute here in Detroit. And my interest also goes back about 15 years in studying the veins. Uh, we tried to develop some technology we call susceptibility weighted imaging that lets us look at the veins and also iron in the brain as well. And uh, a number of years ago we began to look at multiple sclerosis as, as one of those diseases where perhaps there was a venous problem associated with it as early literature had, had suggested. Um, and also in the last few years to study the, the iron content. And what we found was that there seems to be a significant number of MS patients that show abnormal iron content compared to normal people. Um, there also is a, a change in the small venous structure uh, in the brain, and actually that's been demonstrated by some other researchers in New York, uh, showing that the more progressive you get, the, the less uh, visible those veins become. So from our perspective, we felt for many years that the, the vasculature may be playing a, a key role in, in multiple sclerosis. And that's basically how I got interested in this. And uh, I'm interested in, in what you have both said in the sense that uh, now that there have been thousands of people who have been treated using angioplasty, uh, one of the critical issues, I think, is that we're able to do appropriate research with this, that we can follow the patients uh, over time, that we can look at what their status was at the beginning so that they may have an ultrasound scan or a CT scan or an MR scan uh, prior to their treatment, that they get treatment, and then that we can follow these people and, and find out is their blood flow, has their blood flow returned to normal, um, are the lesions going away, is the iron content going away, um, or if patients do unfortunately have problems with uh, restenosis or other difficulties uh, such as uh, thrombosis, um, they may need to be imaged again and then we can monitor this because we'll have the baseline scans that were associated with this. So I, I think that this is a, a wonderful marriage between the needs of the patient and the treatment process uh, and the imaging and research process that, that can all go together here. That's right. And the imaging or the research process is so important to make this real, so to speak, right? To, to get this in the textbooks as a legitimate concept in the world of multiple sclerosis. Well, you, you raise an important point because we're so early in this game at the moment 
that uh, we haven't done double-blinded studies yet. We've really seen the, the world do an observational study that shows that there is some credence to this theory by Professor Zamboni that there is cerebral spinal venous insufficiency. And uh, I think to demonstrate this from a pure research point of view is going to take very well controlled studies. It's going to take animal studies. It's going to take the physics and mathematics of how the whole vascular system in the head and neck and, and spine work mm -hmm. and how all these things integrate together to create this immunological response, this inflammatory response. Um, it, we, we don't know if the vascular problem is the cause, mm -hmm. but there certainly appears to be a strong association with this. So this is, it opens up completely new doors of study that we hope will help better understand multiple sclerosis. Mm -hmm. well, you said um, it's, it's important to have the science. Does that mean people should stop getting the, the treatment now and, and wait for the science to happen? Well, I would pass that question off to Dr. Hewitt at the moment because I'm a physicist, I'm not a physician, <laughs> and perhaps he can speak more to that. It's a difficult answer, question to answer. Um, you know, as a physician and a scientist, we always like to have very strong scientific proof before we go treating people in some manner. I think with any new um, or novel treatment that can affect people and patients in a very positive manner, we have to give some credence to um, some of the empiricism of the good results that we're seeing. And in our practice, we see a large number of patients showing good results. And we can treat patients safely and effectively with a practice, venous angioplasty, that has been around for as long as angioplasty has existed. Mm -hmm. So if we know we can benefit the patient and do it in a safe manner mm -hmm. without compromising our ethics and our morals, mm -hmm. um, I think we should do it. So writing them both in parallel then, the clinical and the science. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, at the same time that we're treating patients and we're doing everything within our knowledge mm -hmm. to help them and improve their quality of life, mm -hmm. I think it's tantamount that we're also um, engaging in efforts such as Dr. Hakey's doing and we're doing with Dr. Hakey to try and lend some scientific proof, some causality and some causation between what we're doing and the results we're seeing. In Are there certain things that patients should be looking for when, when they go out to make a decision about where they would like to have that done? If I were to send my mother or my brother or my, a family member, um, I would tell them first to talk to the practitioners mm -hmm. about not just how many CCSVI cases they've done, but how many venous interventions they've done. How long they've been practicing venous intervention. It's really not that complicated to put a balloon inside somebody's vein and in increase the pressure and watch it go up. Right. It's the extremes and the far ends of the knowledge base that you really want to make sure that your people have. The ability to get through very tight areas of stenosis to deal with those problems, the ability to know what to look for. You want to make sure that the people who are doing these procedures have the knowledge that they're treating the valves. In our practice we found that it's of tantamount importance to be able to um, perform valvuloplasty in a sense to disrupt the valve at the base of the jugular veins and at the apex of the azagous vein in order to achieve a durable result where the rate of restenosis is decreased as much as possible. Um, I would encourage people to make sure that the physician that's performing the procedure is using adequate size balloons. Small balloon angioplasty in large jugular veins is not going to have a durable result. I would encourage people to make sure that all the physicians are looking at the azagous vein. We're finding more and more azagous abnormalities even on venograms that show the azagous looks normal, mm -hmm. we will often put a balloon inside of it and blow it up and see an abnormality. If the top of the jugular vein shows a narrowing, that has to be addressed as well in addition to the bottom. Right. And if that means approaching the top of the jugular vein in a very esoteric fashion, um, it's important to have a practitioner who has the skills to be able to treat the difficult stenoses, mm -hmm. not the easy ones.